In the TIPBS podcast, you get great ideas and practical advice for educators. You can get more invaluable insights and free resources by subscribing to the TIPBS monthly newsletter. Visit www.tipbs.com and register your email address. Hello and welcome to the TIPBS podcast. I am your host, Dr. Kay Eyre. In this special episode, we share with you a teacher coaching call with one of the participants of the TIPBS program. The call follows a structured inquiry process that aims to work collaboratively with teachers to generate ideas for interventions and strategies. To protect the identity of the caller and the student, we have changed their names. If by chance you were to recognize the caller, we request that you pre- please act with professional courtesy to protect the confidentiality of the information discussed. As always, I am joined in the call by my colleague, Dr. Gavin Krishnamurthy, who facilitates the process. We hope you find this call interesting and useful. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the TIPBS podcast. So we're here today with Patty. Um, we're very fortunate to be joined by her. As always, you're joined by me, Dr. Gavin Krishnamurthy and Dr. K. A. Hello, Kay. Hello, how are you? Good. Um, and hi, Patty. Welcome to the program. Hi. All right. So um, the plan for today is to have a bit of a chat about um, school-wide behaviour support. So we're going to hear briefly, Patty, about yourself um, uh, and your role there in the school and perhaps a little bit about your school's context, perhaps. Um, And then we can have a chat about um, some of the sort of interventions and programs you've had in place and um, the successes perhaps you've had with that. So Patty, did you just want to introduce us to yourself and your role? Yep. Um, So I'm located in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. Um, I do behavior support in schools and in homes. And uh, so we follow, like, we use positive behavior support and we have, um, like, our philosophy lies in IABA, so applied behavior analysis. And I don't know, as in interventions, um, I'm primarily in the family home, but I do in schools as well. Okay. So, so yeah. And so, um, you had a teaching background, did you, Patty? Social work background. Social work background. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and so it sounds as though you do in reach into schools and, um, doing in home work as well with families at risk. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Typically if we're in the home, we're in the school as well, trying to bridge between, um, so finding if there's any successes in the school, we take that home. Finding any successes at home, we take that to the school and just trying to bridge the two of them. That's interesting. So it's like a wraparound service, but I suppose mm-hmm. you're the wraparound. <laughs> yeah, the think single wraparound. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're the one person that is able to go in the home and the school because yeah. the school personnel are stuck in the school and then the other in-home supports are stuck in the home. Yeah, so right. So, Patty, what are so the in home support people are different to you again in that they don't cross over into the school? Yeah, typically they're just there to support the parents in the home and they don't really have capacity in the school. Right. So, yeah, our program is like multidisciplinary, so we try to reach as many areas as possible. And how many um, schools would be in your space then that you work with? You just a couple or many? Many. Many? And we, yeah, and we can do so elementary or primary, I guess you call it, and high school. Oh, right. Okay. Do you also do special school? Yeah. What we would call special school, ex, um, alternative schooling. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And so usually our uh, alternative programming is in the regular school. Right. Not in a, not an off-site space. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. That's interesting. Um, yeah, it is. Um, so <coughs> just um, correct me if I'm wrong here, um, Patty. So um, are you part of a government agency or is it a non-government agency? Like what is this sort of service context? 
Um, a government agency. So I work with our um, community living living service delivery. So it's our working with people with intellectual disabilities. And our program started out working with 18 and over mm-hmm. doing behavior support. Um, and then just two years ago branched into um, working with children. So I specifically work with children, but I have counterparts that work with only adults. Okay. All right. Uh, that's, yeah, that's great. Did you have any other questions, Kay, about Patty's context? No, 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 not at all. It's, it's okay. always very interesting because they're all so different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> different to ours, yeah. So, Patty, just to um, get us oriented, so what would your um, – sort of typical day look like and then what would be some of the kind of challenges you'd see sort of in the in-home support and across school? Um, so my typical day, I carry, I typically deal with about up to 10 families and so I like to see my families once a week for usually about two to three hours and um, at first, so say you get a new client at first you go into the home or into the school wherever they're struggling with the challenging behaviors and you're doing assessments um, directly like watching them or you're doing indirect assessments uh, you know looking through any old assess- like psych assessments or uh, educational assessments that they've had in the past kind of getting a history getting an idea of what's going on for them um, and then following the observations it's I mean, sometimes obvious, sometimes not, but mm. following the observations, it's, you figure out what strategies might be helpful um, and what the function of the behavior is. Yep. And so, I mean, like I said, sometimes it's really obvious what it is, and then other times it's a lot more assessment and a lot more observation to figure out, or, you know, the trial and error. You try this strategy because you think it's this function and it's not that function, you know? <laughs> so I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. So, um so yeah, it's just a, it's a lot of observing. It's a lot of getting to know the clients. It's a lot of working with them. Um, so, you know, we'll put the initial programming into place and then it's just each week we kind of touch base and say like, what's working, what's not. Is there certain areas that you're more, you know, if you're struggling with more then we can prioritize that. Um, a lot of times we struggle with um, consistently implementing the program. So, you know, it's all cool. We're going to put a reinforcement program in or whatever it is. And, you know, everybody's on board and then you go back a week later and there's that drift from what we talked about and what they're actually implementing. And they're like, it's not working. I don't know what happened, you know? So it's that weekly check-in is necessary to kind of get people back on track and do the consistency stuff. Um, but yeah, the, and then the other piece obviously is this trauma piece. Mm-hmm. We're dealing, so with our agency, we only deal with children who have open files with Ministry of Social Services. Mm-hmm. So we have child safety files. And okay. yeah, so we deal with a lot of um, families that have experienced so much trauma. And then on top of it are dealing with the challenging behaviors. Yeah. So sometimes we can address the challenging behaviors, but there's still that whole trauma piece that's influencing those challenging behaviors. That's that's the hard piece to deal with. So sometimes I find I'm just a family counselor <laughs> for three, four weeks. Um, and then, you know, I have to remind myself that I'm here for behavior, not for family counseling. So, uh, yeah, so those are the two things I find the most difficult, that consistency piece and then that trauma. So. Patty, do the families have access to other counseling services or is it just basically yourself who is their support? They do. They- <laughs> They range from not having any services to being over-serviced. Right. Because, you know, the the case manager thinks like, oh, I'm just going to put all these services in and then they'll be fine. But then all of a sudden, you know, each kid has a counselor. Mom and dad have a counselor. I'm mm-hmm. in there. Somebody else is in there. So there, we do have the services. It's just I think me being in the family environment is more comfortable than someone going to a counseling appointment. And less, yeah, less busy and confusing and adding yeah more stress about what to do <laughs> yeah and I'm, and I'm crying right I'm asking questions about like how does the family run what are you struggling uh, with yeah so that opens a lot of doors <laughs> yeah. yeah so you would need to have you would spend a considerable amount of time in the first instance building up relationships with them before you really start crying <laughs> yeah. for want of a better description I mean you'd be able to yeah. weave that in but you would really I mean to because that's I'm just thinking that that's something that I guess 
as classroom teachers and your classroom teachers would be the same that um, I know, you know, 30 odd years ago when I started teaching, it was quite acceptable for us to go around to the child's house when it was their birthday and go around mm -hmm. on the weekend and say, how are you going? And then that became very unacceptable and yeah. and not the way to do things um and it was no your job is at school and you stay out of stay out of the home and stop being chummy and yeah. um so we stopped doing that and and we yeah we just don't don't ever have that thought that you know it'd be nice occasionally to go with a colleague and knock on the door and say how are you going and but we mm -hmm. don't because it's really advised against and I just yeah I just wondered when you're actually in the privacy of their home yeah the relationship building would just be so it, so it, well it's it it's everything isn't it yeah yeah and it's it's 10 times easier you're in their environment right yes, there not the other way around the yeah power, right? yeah that's their domain so um so yeah, it's really easy to build relationship. Um, it's very difficult to change patterns of behavior, though. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But, and the other thing I find here, I don't know if it's the case with you guys, but like the teachers are over capacity. They don't have, mm. even if it was acceptable to go to the home, they don't have the time to do that. No. <laughs> right? No. I think that's true with any any yes. profession. Yes. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Patty, I am just aware of the time and I want this oh, to be yes. useful for you. <laughs> um, so, I, I thought a couple of things, a couple of sort of ideas that might be useful um, is this um, piece around kind of function that you were talking about before. I thought that might be useful for us to have a chat, which might then give us an opportunity to tell you about how the um, uh, program itself sort of thinks about function and, and mm -hmm. how it um, thinks about trauma and things like that. Um, the other one, which we might not get time to, but I'll just flag it now anyway, um, is that it, it sounds as though you're working across settings. I wouldn't say it's a case management role, but it, it, it's almost as though you're managing different levels of complexity, <laughs> if you mm -hmm. want. Uh, yeah. It sounds like quite complex work. So um, I'll tell you about how we think about that from a case management kind of point of view in a trauma-informed kind of way. So there's a model in which we think about that. So that might be useful as well. Um, does that sort of sound okay to you, Kay? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Sorry, I, I keep muting my mic in case I um, end up coughing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, no, so, that sounds great. Patty, I'll start with you. So when you were talking about function, where do you think it really gets unstuck, particularly with the kids who've got um, trauma history? What have you found um, is a missing piece there, do you think, when you're trying to kind of do the assessments and um, try to understand the function? Uh, I mean, like we have our typical functions like attention or escape or tangible, yeah. whatever it is, right? Yeah. And it's almost as if, some of them like the function is trauma yeah. or directly linked to you know so it's like it's attention plus it's you know escape plus so how does that fit in like is it a function or is it just related is it something we add in extra yeah like, yeah we're gonna suck with yeah yeah um so i i guess um I was to really think broadly about the program. I think one of the ways, um, so Kay and I used to work together in the public system um, mm -hmm. and Kay used to be the team leader for a intervention centre. Is that right, Kay? Yeah, close enough, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, Behaviour support team. Very much like a team of people like you, Patty, and we had an intervention centre where kids went when they were excluded from school. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, so they were there for... 12 weeks maximum and then they were reintegrated back into school oh wow yeah but we didn't have any what we would call outside services as such we were teachers doing the very best that we could mm. yeah you know yeah. so until yeah we met people like Gavind who were working with child youth and mental health so so mm -hmm. yeah so I'm, I'm a psychologist Patty and and one of the ways we were trying to work out is for everyone to sort of speak the same language a little bit, that usually helps across home and school. And, and so we'd pro do the piece where we're working in the families, but we would help teachers as well. Um, and so th this idea of thinking about the function was what was kind of common between us in terms of, 
you know, informing any interventions and collecting data or whatever it is, that the function piece was really important. But thinking about function with these sort of complex kids, we, we realized we had to think more broadly, um, that the sort of general PBS principles applied. Um, so clearly this was serving some sort of, you know, the behavior had meaning, it was serving some sort of purpose. Um, yeah there was a sense that they were getting something from this behavior or they were sort of avoiding something from this behavior. Um, but what it is then becomes more complex. So the kind of three broad kind of areas we look at, the first one we look at is what we call um, regulation coping, which is we know a whole heap about how trauma affects the brain now. Um, I'm sure you've mm -hmm. been close to that there. Um, you've got the wonderful Bruce Perry who's from there, isn't he? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so we, we know a whole heap about that um, and we know a lot about the troubles kids have um, with managing their emotions. So they get triggered off very easily um, uh, and it kind of brings back memories to them and brings back sensory experiences to them. Um, mm -hmm. And so in those moments, they're trying to get some sort of sense of control over their body or their environment um so either what they're doing is that they're trying to control everything from them um so that they can get lots of control or they're trying to get away from that situation that's making them feel this way so essentially they feel completely out of control with their body and they're grasping for any sort of control or avoid whatever it is that's happening around them right. did you have anything else you wanted to add to that Kay? Um, no, not at the moment. Only to say that, yes, Paddy, I, it was quite a shift in my thinking when I met Govind because we ran our whole centre and our behaviour support team on a very black and white positive behaviour support, ABA, find out the function, design the behaviour plan and then yeah. for somebody to say, well, okay, that's that's perhaps not enough here. You have all these other things going on and, oh, yeah, no, but needs, no, no, you can't do needs because they're not observable or measurable. And, you know, that sort of saying, well, hey, this is an absolutely evidence-based perfect foundation and, yes, that's where we start. But for the trauma-informed behaviour, it, it just wasn't enough. And that, that was quite... Um, you know, quite a shift in our thinking to say, you know, well, it, it's okay to to build in an extra, you know, sort of support that might mm -hmm. be making you think a little bit differently from your FBA little, you know, space. Yeah. So, yeah, so, and, and, and a lot of what Govind as a psychologist taught us and sort of um, you could you could absolutely see where it fits because... You know, you might have the term regulation coping, but, okay, their behaviour's out of control. I know that. I've seen it, you know. So you could you could sort of match up the terms and think, yeah, well, actually, we actually do so much of this intuitively, but we just haven't formalised it in a, you know, yeah. and worked out where it matches in, yeah. 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 Anyway, sorry, Govind, I digress. That's all right. So, Patty, um, a lot of those sort of hypotheses about the regulation coping then lends itself to, I mean, various types of emotion regulation stuff, but primarily we've kind of looked at a lot of those sensory approaches, essentially, um, mm -hmm. looking at, um, you know, essentially giving kids some mastery over their body, some mastery over their triggers and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, did you have any questions or thoughts about that, Patty? So when you say sensory, like, do you have an example? Yeah, 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 yeah sure. Um, so um, one of the things uh, we know about, uh, well, an easy one is that a lot of kids who have experienced trauma are quite um, what we call like kinesthetic learners. Um, so mm -hmm. one of the big interventions we often suggest is having sort of brain breaks or, you know, periodic kind of little movement breaks in class. Um so I think the website's called, it's quite popular now. It's called, um, I think, Go Noodle. Um, you might have seen it. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah. So it's quite cool. It's got so many videos on it now compared to when we first started. Okay. <laughs> um, so there's lots of like really nifty stuff, really, you know, two to three minute kind of things. Um, and what we sort of, how we kind of explain it and sell it is that it's kind of bringing the kids back into their body. It grounds them. Um, mm -hmm. It orients them. Um, it gives them that sort of sensory break because with kind of regulation coping, it's like, um, there's hypervigilance so these kids are always on the lookout so it's like a you know yeah. it's like a car's engine revving you go vroom, 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 vroom. <laughs> so you yeah. either kind of stop and just let them you know let the engine cool down a bit um or you know you have them really blow their top and you know, yeah you might be able to attend. so that's like a simple one um there are lots of other you know the ot's do a great job um of other yeah things. no i just wanted to make sure that when you were saying sensory it meant the same thing that i would mean and it yeah. is yeah 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 and we use the program uh me moves a lot oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And so we found that, that quite successful because you can take it into the home too and yeah. it's short it's quick it's easy you know it doesn't ask a lot from the parents but it does it brings the kids back into their body they're doing the movements and um it's it's quite effective yeah yeah no that's great yeah, that, would be, that would be similar um and something with regulation coping that we've kind of used across homes is kind of just the way they structure the the kids days you know or the even the weeks and is there enough physical activity? Because I don't know what it's like there, Patty, but here sometimes the kids are on their Xbox, you know, a lot of the time. And it's hard because I can kind of, I get it. Like they're, they're sort of out of trouble. They're out of your face and they're yeah. quiet <laughs> <laughs> for hours on end. So um, I kind of get it. So, you know, suggesting a lot of that stuff to plan across their week. Um, you know, use across kind of cr critical transition points like bedtimes or morning routines. Mm -hmm. um, those are some things we look at as well. Um, so the next piece is the attachment coping. So attachment coping primarily is informed by attachment theory. Um, we always get a hard time about this, don't we, Kay? Because it's quite a psychodynamic yeah. <laughs> way of thinking. A lot of the theories are, and, and you know, we don't shy away from that. Um, but I, I think what it does is it just, you know, when we're thinking about that attention piece, it just helps us think about that in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. um, in that, I mean, the very basic kind of line I often use is, you know, is, um, there's no harm in coming up with a hypothesis that the child is wanting your attention. Um, yeah. But, but the, very, the subtleties with the language around attention is that, you know, automatically you think your interventions then are to not give them attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that you kind of respond punitively. Um, instead, if you thought about it as a child who's had a rough time, um, who has a lot of trouble asking for emotional connection or, or any sort of support, that mm -hmm. the way they do it is a connection-seeking strategy. It's just not the best way to ask for help or support. Um, but essentially, it's them trying to meet some of those needs. So it's sort of connection-seeking rather than attention-seeking. Um, yeah, yeah. We use um, we try to steer clear of attention too, because then people mm. have that mindset of like, oh, it's just for attention, yeah. um, which is kind of an old school thought. And so we focused on um, social contact. Sometimes yeah. we'll say like they're seeking social contact yeah. instead of attention seeking. So, and that seems to help a little bit with. But I, I like this connection seeking because mm. um, just recently I've started reading so much on attachment and. Um, how it plays into behavior support because I deal with so much um, severed attachment. Yeah. Yeah. With kids that are taken away and brought back home and taken away and brought back home or kids that are living in foster homes, right? So um, I started researching a lot on that stuff. So that's good to hear that it's, it's what you guys are doing too. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's such a simple thing, keeping that word out. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it? That attachment, uh, that attention, because the number yeah. of times teachers even I don't know Patty but I know still I walk into a classroom and they go ah oh she wants his attention she's not getting it blah, blah, blah. and you're yeah. thinking oh yeah. no <laughs> it's like well, I'm yeah. not giving it to it no, no, no. <laughs> yeah yeah <It's>, exactly <laughs> mm. so um 
Yeah, like Kay was saying before, Paddy, and you'd probably know this, but um, that's often core in the work in terms of helping kids feel safe is, Mm -hmm. you know, they're constantly worried about people rejecting them, abandoning them, about shaming them, about embarrassing them, that they don't really have an experience of grown-ups or other kids who really care about them or, you know, have their back. And you can kind of see the cycle of that playing out because if, if you believe that no one's, you know, got your back, then you're going to act like you're the only one <laughs> which gets you into yeah. trouble, which then, you know, gives you more evidence to say, look, no one's actually, no one cares about me and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So, um, so it's really about breaking that cycle and, and um, you know, really thinking about miscommunications when they're, they're really playing up, they're really, uh, you know, saying things like you hate me, or, you know, you're going to get rid of me, all that stuff, to really decode that a little bit and think about what's the function here? You know, I think, he, you know, he's possibly feeling really insecure about, you know, being in my class or being in this foster placement or whatever it is. And that perhaps even though, you know, every bone in your body is t- <laughs> telling you to kind of use punishment or have some sort of consequence. I think it's important to have consequences, but to have it in a meaningful way where you can strengthen that attachment relationship. You can yeah. Trust. Um, you can use that time to, you know, help them talk about things and calm down um, that way. So that's mm-hmm. a simple thing, really. Did you have any uh, other thoughts or questions about that? Um, Sounds like you do a lot of that stuff. Um, yeah. You find a lot of that stuff, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I read uh, Hold On To Your Kids. Oh, uh, yeah. Gordon Neufeld. Yeah. And so that's kind of where I started is like the attachment piece is really, it's key, right? So um, we do a lot of that stuff, you know, like where they're saying, you know, you hate me or you're going to kick me out or whatever it is. And it's finding kind of the message behind that and then validating those feelings and making them feel secure and safe. So. Yeah. We did that. We did a um, podcast interview with this. Um, he's a um, American psychologist called Dave Zeigler. Um, anyway, he's he's a fantastic speaker. But he he talks about how kids speak in opposites. So <laughs> when yeah. they say, you know, I hate you, what they're really saying is, you know, I love you, but this is all too much for me. You know. Um, yeah. Or she's, or they say you're going to leave me. What they're really saying is, I really hope you stay. <laughs> yeah. Please stay. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah, it's, it's not a perfect translation, but it's quite a nice way to think about it, I think. Yeah. Um, and the last piece, um, which I think um, is quite important, is what we call like skills deficit coping. So a lot of um, kids, particularly tra- uh, kids who have been traumatized, miss kind of huge, uh, that, you know, periods of school. Um, what we know too in terms of the learning kind of difficulties they have is that, um, you know, they don't grow up in particularly um, enriching kind of environments. Um, And so really um, school or home or any sort of relationship is really about teaching them those life skills, the social emotional skills. Um, Mm -hmm. And, that it you know and that can happen in a variety of ways um that you can teach them that i mean the biggest one really is um what we call inhibitory control so um you know impulse control so and it you know something as sim- simple as like a stop think do strategy <laughs> um you know keeping it really really simple really visual um so helping the kids kind of learn some of that pro social and emotional control kind of um skills I find that's quite an important piece because I think, I don't know if you've had this experience, I don't care, but I've definitely had it, um, where, you know, we have the two extremes where we have um, kids who, you know, they can't even tolerate them in the school or at home. And, you know, they're, they're constantly on suspensions and they're out of school and all that. Um, and yeah. the message essentially is we don't kind of want them here. Um, but what, I find what's equally difficult to watch and I don't know how damaging it is, is um, schools that keep them there or, or even kind of carers who keep them there, but they're not really in an enriching or learning environment. You know, it's all about putting out fires constantly. Yeah. Um, and it often feels like it's only about time before, you know, like it all falls over because they aren't actually, 
you know, learning anything. And, and sometimes that's okay because it might be just about stabilization and making people feel safe. Um, mm-hmm. But when that kind of keeps going and there's no plan to do that third piece, uh, yeah. kind of say, look, I think he's doing this because he doesn't know a better way or, you know, mm-hmm. he hasn't got the skill to do it. When we don't have things in place for that, um, often it just becomes about risk management. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have a, lot of, what, yeah. a lot of what I do is risk management. And then once that crisis has kind of come down, mm. then we can work on all this good stuff. But yeah. a lot of the families live in that crisis zone yeah. and they don't know how to, you know, get moved forward, move past that. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's essentially the challenge across the board with a lot of these families, I think. Um, so Patty, we have frameworks in each of those, um, which, you know, we probably don't have time to do, but one of the things that I know, at least with the regulation coping, we talk a lot about is having, um, kind of safety plans and, and plans for intervention across, um, different kind of levels of arousal. Um, so, Often, um, the standard line I use about the program is, um, well, first of all, I'm pretty cynical when someone comes at me with a program. <laughs> so I want them to tell me what, you know, what, how it's actually different. And the way I sort of explain it is that um, a lot of these concepts are quite similar to a lot of other kind of programs and approaches out there. Perhaps what's different is that we talk not, not just about what we do, but about how we do it and when we do it. Um, so mm-hmm. the piece about when we do it kind of ties into the regulation coping because what we know, I mean, even for ourselves, that our capacity is different at different levels of um, arousal and anger. Mm-hmm. So if I'm really, you know, angry or oh, my one-year-old's really not listening to me and I've had a rough day, <laughs> I'm not in my wisest uh, mind um, and that I've got to, um, you know, think about, you know, what I'm capable of doing. And it's the same for the kids as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you're in that crisis kind of stage, there are just some things you cannot focus on. You know, you've just got to focus on immediate safety. You've got to mm-hmm. focus on containment. Um, but the more, you know, repeated experiences of that with kind of planned approaches, hopefully it becomes slightly more predictable. Um, yeah. For the families, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We, we use the term crisis cycle. Yeah. So you know, like with the curve, and when you're at the top of the curve, you're not learning a whole lot. Mm. So it's just kind of getting you to the bottom of the curve before you can learn. Yeah. But yeah. Yes, so you have the safety plans, and then you have the plans that you put across the board yeah. that are just. Yeah, that makes that sense. Sounds excellent. Yeah, yeah. Kay, did you want to say anything about those sort of safety crisis plan stuff, like from a school point of view? I don't know. Patty, is your situation one where schools have um, a pretty standard plan that they have to adhere to for crisis? No, because a lot, a lot of our, a lot of our, um, all of our state schools here in Queensland, they have a, um, they have to have a responsible behaviour plan, which is like a template where you fill in, you know, your levels of intervention and support. Okay. And attached to that is a what we call a risk assessment plan. And so it's sort of a pretty standard, you know, document so um, that the parents have to have signed off on. And if, uh, so it's basically like, uh, you know, if behaviours are escalating, the teachers will do ABC. Yeah, yeah. And, and that has to be in line with their responsible behaviour plan for students document that all schools must have so whatever their response is when things Mm -hmm. are unsafe it has to match exactly what they've detailed in their responsible behavior plan and um, any any strategies that are listed in that um, risk assessment plan the parent has to be made fully aware of and sign off on Mm. because often at that point in our schools there may be not not routinely but there could be the need for restraint if the child is unsafe and dangerous and um, therefore the school has to very clearly um, outline that the staff are are trained in we have in um, non-violent crisis intervention so the the team is um, you know um, trained in that and as a very last resort if your child does 
this, this or this, restraint may be used to keep your child safe. And, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, so the parents are integral in that um, so that they know exactly if the wheels fall off at school and the child becomes unsafe, what they're going to do. So we have sort of like a, a standard template format where we sort of slot in um, the, the little different individualities of the school in, in that context. So, um, mm. it, it, and because a lot of our schools are PBS schools, then it, you know, correlates obviously to what we call the red zone behaviour and um, it sort of fits in in that um, tier three response sort of space. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I think our main problem is in schools is that is the resourcing, making sure when we write the risk assessment plan that our response is doable at any given time in a <laughs> Which is pretty hard, isn't it, in a school mm. that mm. Yeah, whatever our response is will consistently happen. Mm. That seems to be our biggest problem um, and, and that's in the proactive planning, you know, mm. and thinking through all those little scenarios about but what if, but what if, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's that consistency of response and we find the language used and I don't know about yourself but... So an element that we found was missing was that we'd come up with these risk assessment plans, which was great, but we wouldn't actually act them out when mm. everything was calm. Mm. And the first time something had happened, actually, I didn't, resp I didn't interpret that strategy the same way as mm. you did. And then we'd have all this inconsistency because I thought I understood what it meant. So I didn't yeah. ask because I was certain I knew what to do. But then yeah. when it actually unfolded in front of me, you know, I didn't actually know what to do in the context of the other team members. So mm -hmm. it was that real, like we know in behaviour for any kids, it was that practising when things were calm. We do that for the kids, but we didn't do it for us. We do fire drills and we have lockdowns, as we call them, but yeah. we didn't practise this. We just waited yeah. until it happened and then thought, oh, that's right, I've got to do X, Y, Z. And it was the first time any of us had done it and that just, yeah, sometimes it wasn't great. But <clears throat> the intent was the intent was there and we got through it, but it tended to slide back to punitive really quickly. Yeah, because that's what we know. Because that's what we know and that's what we're comfortable with and we get panicked and we get fearful because it's unsafe and you're thinking, oh, my goodness, I've got all these children and staff to protect and then you, you know, start raising your voice and doing all the things that you reflect on later and think, yeah. Mm, that mm. was probably not a wise thing to do. But, you know, <laughs> no harm is ever invoked, but still, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <clears throat> mm. I think, like, we don't have anything in our schools that is a safety plan. We have a lot of goal-based um, forms. So these are the goals we want to accomplish all year. That's great, but we don't have anything to say. Mm. If things break down, this is what we're going to do. Right. Yeah. I mean, one of the uh, things I say, Patty, and I think I stole this from you, Kay, from the workshops, but... You know, like with the kids in the red zone, I hope you know what we mean, you know, with the PBS triangle, these are the kids right mm -hmm. on top. You know, we say, you know it's coming. You know it's mm -hmm. going to happen. <laughs> you know they're going to have a time when they're not going to. So let's not pretend like, you know, it's never going to happen and it's a blank slate. And, they, you know, these are vulnerable children. So let's yeah. just plan for it. Let's just plan for it. Let's just practice it. And you know what? Um, safety comes before anything. And, and one of the points I actually make, and this is often an elephant in the room when we're working uh, well with, with families as well, is grown-ups get scared. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So grown-ups get scared of the kids. I'm not saying they necessarily always get scared of the child. Sometimes that does happen. Um, but they get scared of other things, about other kids getting hurt, about, you know, lots of other things. So mm -hmm. we need everyone feeling safe, including the child. Um, so let's plan for that because if we don't have safety, um, we're starting on very, very shaky ground. Um, and, Paddy, just a, a quick little strategy I was thinking of too is when at Gavin's right, we always had our risk... <laughs> You don't want to feel negative, but he's right. It's inevitable, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And so if you planned for it, it just gives teachers that much more confidence. And we used to have standard phrases that we would give teachers as, you know, to practice, like you do kids, you know, a bit like mm -hmm. self-affirmations. But 
standard phrases that they would trot out at that crisis point, like in our intervention centre when we had, you know, a child holding the computer monitor above their head and they'd lined us up for, a, you know, wearing the computer monitor or whatever was going to come across the room, we would instantly say, I'm here to keep you safe. I'm here to keep you safe. So we had like a broken record, a couple of broken record statements, and that mm -hmm. sort of makes you feel really confident in yourself when you are frightened because yeah. everybody, like Gavin said, you get frightened. You, your situation is, especially when it's very physically aggressive and you have been hurt by this child before, mm -hmm. if you can calm, keep yourself calm and focused by saying a statement, whatever that might be, like we used to say, I'm here to keep you safe, um, you can sort of calm yourself enough to then think logically. And um, mm -hmm. so sometimes having those little statements, you know, whatever you guys come up with is, is really important you know, really important, yeah. And a plan for yeah, and I think that's where we get stuck is that we say, don't do this, don't do this, don't mm. do this, but then we don't say what to do. So mm. then they're left with nothing. They have no strategies left mm. because they're not allowed to do these ones. They don't know what else to do. No, and we used to not wait. That was something yeah. we didn't do well. We had to learn to say, I'm here to keep you safe and then stop. Mm -hmm. and provide silence and wait, but be very, mo you know, monitoring and you had all the plan and just stop and think and stop trying to jump in and talk when there was, when we just had to learn to be quiet mm. and yeah, breathe, the, yeah. <clears throat> you know, because we tend to jump in all the time and, 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 the, and you just got to stop <laughs> and think. It's in the, and we'd say to teachers and you're thinking in your head, okay, what do I do now? Okay, if, if this happens, what's the plan? And you've got time to stop, rehearse inside your head and just watch, yeah. <laughs> you know, and we were not doing that well. We were jumping in, trying to fix the situation yeah. and escalating the situation. Yeah, yeah, um, that's a good yeah. point. <clears throat> Great. All right, I'm just aware of the time, Paddy. How, how are we going? Um, did you have any other specific questions for us about um, some of the challenges you've faced there or anything particular about anything we've talked about? I don't think so. I think, like, it's nice because I think a lot of it is what we're doing already. It's yeah, just I don't yeah. think, like Kay was saying, we didn't really put it in, like, it's not structured. We just do it. So yeah. it's nice to have it kind of written down in those three sections to know that we're covering all areas. Um, so that's good. I mean, I can no, probably... Just talk about this all day but yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 can i just say i think what's really wonderful is that they have a role like yourself oh where, yes um you can collect data and really look at implementation um mm -hmm. because you know like i feel like 90 percent of this is in the implementation you know it's about those sort of subtleties of how things are delivered that kind of we call it like regression to the mean about with punitive kind of strategies, you know, that kind yeah. of gravitational pull towards it. And, and, you know, it completely makes sense why people kind of do that. But um, that kind of piece with you having it, I can just imagine how invaluable it would be mm. to have that consistency across um, home and school, getting people on the same page, especially for kids like this. Um, so, um, so I don't know if you hear this a lot in your work. So thank you for your work and your work with the families. Um, yeah, we really do kind of, you know, love hearing from people who put in the hard yards because yes. I cannot imagine it's easy. <laughs> no, <laughs> we don't have any system like that here in Queensland. So it's, yeah, it's really wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's mm, different, but it's, it's challenging in itself because we're oh, yeah. big. Right. So it's good to hear from you guys and know that we're at least, you know, on par. Absolutely. We're doing something right. So. Yeah, you are. It's great. Yeah. Sounds terrific. So feel free to keep in touch, Patty. It was really nice talking to you. Um, yes, yeah, send us an email. We'd love to kind of hear from you. Um, yeah, and keep in touch. Yeah, it was awesome. great to meet you. Yeah, this was awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Right. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. That was a teacher coaching call as part of our TIPBS program. If you would like to book in for a coaching call for yourself, visit www.tipbs.com and register your details. Thank you for listening. See you next time.